Chapter 8 The Babe of Bethlehem The Birth of Jesus Equally definite with the prophecies declaring that the Messiah would be born in the lineage of David are the predictions that fix the place of his birth at Bethlehem, a small town in Judea. There seems to have been no difference of opinion among priests, scribes, or rabbis on the matter, either before or since the great event. Bethlehem, though small and of little importance in trade or commerce, was doubly endeared to the Jewish heart as the birthplace of David and as that of the prospective Messiah. Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth of Galilee, far removed from Bethlehem of Judea, and at the time of which we speak, the maternity of the Virgin was fast approaching. At that time a decree went out from Rome, ordering a taxing of the people in all kingdoms and provinces tributary to the empire. The call was of general scope. It provided that all the world should be taxed. The taxing herein referred to may properly be understood as an enrollment or a registration, whereby a census of Roman subjects would be secured, upon which as a basis the taxation of the different peoples would be determined. This particular census was the second of three such general registrations recorded by historians as occurring at intervals of about twenty years. Had the census been taken by the usual Roman method, each person would have been enrolled at the town of his residence. But the Jewish custom, for which the Roman law had respect, necessitated registration at the cities or towns claimed by the respective families as their ancestral homes. As to whether the requirement was strictly mandatory that every family should thus register at the city of its ancestors, we need not be specially concerned. Certain it is that Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, the city of David, to be inscribed under the imperial decree. The little town was crowded at the time, most likely by the multitude that had come in obedience to the same summons, and in consequence Joseph and Mary failed to find the most desirable accommodations and had to be content with the conditions of an improvised camp, as travelers unnumbered had done before and as uncounted others have done since in that region and elsewhere. We cannot reasonably regard this circumstance as evidence of extreme destitution. Doubtless it entailed inconvenience, but it gives us no assurance of great distress or suffering. It was while she was in this situation that Mary the Virgin gave birth to her firstborn, the Son of the Highest, the only begotten of the Eternal Father, Jesus the Christ. But few details of attendant circumstances are furnished us. We are not told how soon the birth occurred after the arrival of Mary and her husband at Bethlehem. It may have been the purpose of the evangelist who made the record to touch upon matters of purely human interest as lightly as was consistent with the narration of fact in order that the central truth might neither be hidden nor overshadowed by unimportant incident. We read in Holy Writ this only of the actual birth. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In vivid contrast with the simplicity and brevity of the scriptural accounts, and of its paucity of incidental details, is the mass of circumstance supplied by the imagination of men, much of which is wholly unsupported by authoritative record, and in many respects is plainly inconsistent and untrue. It is the part of prudence and wisdom to segregate and keep distinctly separate the authenticated statements of fact in so momentous a matter from the fanciful commentaries of historians, theologians, and writers of fiction, as also from the emotional rhapsodies of poets and artistic extravaganzas wrought by chisel or brush. From the period of its beginning, Bethlehem had been the home of people engaged mostly in pastoral and agricultural pursuits. It is quite in line with what is known of the town and its environs to find at the season of Messiah's birth, which was in the springtime of the year, that flocks were in the field both night and day under the watchful care of their keepers. And to certain of these humble shepherds came the first proclamation that the Savior had been born. Thus runs the simple record. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, 
and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Tidings of such import had never before been delivered by angel or received by man. Good tidings of great joy, given to but few and those among the humblest of earth, but destined to spread to all people. There is sublime grandeur in the scene, as there is divine authorship in the message, and the climax is such as the mind of man could never have conceived the sudden appearance of a multitude of the heavenly host singing audibly to human ears the briefest, most consistent, and most truly complete of all the songs of peace ever attuned by mortal or spirit choir. What a consummation to be wished, peace on earth! But how can such come except through the maintenance of good will toward men? And through what means could glory to God in the highest be more effectively rendered? The trustful and unsophisticated keepers of sheep had not asked for sign or confirmation. Their faith was in unison with the heavenly communication. Nevertheless, the angel had given them what he called a sign to guide them in their search. They waited not, but went in haste, for in their hearts they believed, yea, more than believed, they knew, and this was the tenor of their resolve. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They found the babe in the manger, with the mother and Joseph nearby. And having seen, they went out and testified to the truth concerning the child. They returned to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. There is meaning as deep as the pathos that all must feel in the seemingly parenthetical remark by Luke. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. It is apparent that the great truth as to the personality and mission of her divine Son had not yet unfolded itself in its fullness to her mind. The whole course of events, from the salutation of Gabriel to the reverent testimony of the shepherds concerning the announcing angel and the heavenly hosts, was largely a mystery to that stainless mother and wife. Requirements of the law strictly observed. The child was born a Jew, the mother was a Jewess, and the reputed and legal father, Joseph, was a Jew. The true paternity of the child was known to but few, perhaps at that time to none save Mary, Joseph, and possibly Elizabeth and Zacharias. As he grew, he was regarded by the people as Joseph's son. The requirements of the law were carried out with exactitude in all matters pertaining to the child. When eight days old, he was circumcised, as was required of every male born in Israel. And at the same time, he received as an earthly bestowal the name that had been prescribed at the Annunciation. He was called Jesus, which being interpreted is Savior. The name was rightfully his, for he came to save the people from their sins. Part of the law given through Moses to the Israelites in the wilderness and continued in force down through the centuries related to the procedure prescribed for women after childbirth. In compliance therewith, Mary remained in retirement 40 days following the birth of her son. Then she and her husband brought the boy for presentation before the Lord as prescribed for the male firstborn of every family. It is manifestly impossible that all such presentations could have taken place in the temple for many Jews lived at great distances from Jerusalem. It was the rule, however, that parents should present their children in the temple when possible. Jesus was born within five or six miles from Jerusalem. He was accordingly taken to the temple for the ceremonial of redemption from the requirement applying to the firstborn of all Israelites except Levites. It will be remembered that the children of Israel had been delivered from the bondage of Egypt with the accompaniment of signs and wonders. 
Because of Pharaoh's repeated refusals to let the people go, plagues had been brought upon the Egyptians, one of which was the death of the firstborn throughout the land, excepting only the people of Israel. In remembrance of this manifestation of power, the Israelites were required to dedicate their firstborn sons to the service of the sanctuary. Subsequently, the Lord directed that all males belonging to the tribe of Levi should be devoted to this special labor instead of the firstborn in every tribe. Nevertheless, the eldest son was still claimed as particularly the Lord's own and had to be formally exempted from the earlier requirement of service by the paying of a ransom. In connection with the ceremony of purification, every mother was required to furnish a yearling lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove for a sin offering. But in the case of any woman who was unable to provide a lamb, a pair of doves or pigeons might be offered. We learn of the humble circumstances of Joseph and Mary from the fact that they brought the less costly offering, two doves or pigeons, instead of one bird and a lamb. Among the righteous and devout Israelites were some who, in spite of traditionalism, rabbinism, and priestly corruption, still lived in righteous expectation of inspired confidence, awaiting patiently the consolation of Israel. One of these was Simeon, then living in Jerusalem. Through the power of the Holy Ghost, he had gained the promise that he should not see death until he had looked upon the Lord's Christ in the flesh. Prompted by the Spirit, he repaired to the temple on the day of the presentation of Jesus and recognized in the babe the promised Messiah. In the moment of realization that the hope of his life had found glorious consummation, Simeon raised the child reverently in his arms and with the simple but undying eloquence that comes of God uttered this splendid supplication in which thanksgiving, resignation, and praise are so richly blended. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Then under the spirit of prophecy, Simeon told of the greatness of the child's mission and of the anguish that the mother would be called to endure because of him, which would be even like unto that of a sword piercing her soul. The Spirit's witness to the divinity of Jesus was not to be confined to a man. There was at that time in the temple a godly woman of great age, Anna, a prophetess who devoted herself exclusively to temple service. And she, being inspired of God, recognized her Redeemer and testified of him to all about her. Both Joseph and Mary marveled at the things that were spoken of the child. Seemingly, they were not yet able to comprehend the majesty of him who had come to them through so miraculous a conception and so marvelous a birth. Wise men search for the king. Sometime after the presentation of Jesus in the temple, though how long we are not told, possibly but a few days, possibly weeks or even months, Herod, king of Judea, was greatly troubled as were the people of Jerusalem in general, over the report that a child of prophecy, one destined to become king of the Jews, had been born. Herod was professedly an adherent of the religion of Judah, though by birth an Idumean, by descent an Edomite, or one of the posterity of Esau, all of whom the Jews hated. And of all Edomites, not one was more bitterly detested than was Herod the king. He was tyrannical and merciless, sparing neither foe nor friend who came under suspicion of being a possible hindrance to his ambitious designs. He had his wife and several of his sons, as well as others of his blood kindred, cruelly murdered. And he put to death nearly all of the great national council, the Sanhedrin. His reign was one of revolting cruelty and unbridled oppression. Only when in danger of inciting a national revolt or in fear of incurring the displeasure of his imperial master, the Roman emperor, did he stay his hand in any undertaking. Rumors of the birth of Jesus reached Herod's ears in this way. There came to Jerusalem certain men from afar, wise men they were called, and they asked, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Herod summoned 
all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and demanded of them where, according to the prophets, Christ should be born. They answered him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Herod sent secretly for the wise men, and inquired of them as to the source of their information, and particularly as to the time at which the star, to which they attached such significance, had appeared. Then he directed them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. As the men set out from Jerusalem on the last stage of their journey of inquiry and search, they rejoiced exceedingly, for the new star they had seen in the east was again visible. They found the house wherein Mary was living with her husband and the babe, and as they recognized the royal child, they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Having thus gloriously accomplished the purpose of their pilgrimage, these devout and learned travelers prepared to return home and would have stopped at Jerusalem to report to the king as he had requested. But being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Much has been written beyond all possible warrant of scriptural authority concerning the visit of the Magi, or wise men, who thus sought and found the infant Christ. As a matter of fact, we are left without information as to their country, nation, or tribal relationship. We are not even told how many they were, though unauthenticated tradition has designated them as the three wise men, and has even given them names, whereas they are left unnamed in the scriptures the only true record of them extant, and may have numbered but two or many. Attempts have been made to identify the star whose appearance in their eastern sky had assured the Magi that the king was born. But astronomy furnishes no satisfactory confirmation. The recorded appearance of the star has been associated by both ancient and modern interpreters with the prophecy of Balaam, who, though not an Israelite, had blessed Israel and under divine inspiration had predicted, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Moreover, as already shown, the appearance of a new star was a predicted sign recognized and acknowledged among the people of the Western world as witness of Messiah's birth. The Flight into Egypt Herod's perfidy in directing the Magi to return and report to him where the royal infant was to be found, falsely professing that he wished to worship him also, while in his heart he purposed taking the child's life, was thwarted by the divine warning given to the wise men as already noted. Following their departure, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. In obedience to this command, Joseph took Mary and her child and set out by night on the journey to Egypt, and there the family remained until divinely directed to return. When it was apparent to the king that the wise men had ignored his instructions, he was exceedingly angry, and estimating the earliest time at which the birth could have occurred, according to the Magi's statement of the stars appearing, He ruthlessly ordered the slaughter of all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under. In this massacre of the innocents, the evangelist found a fulfillment of Jeremiah's fateful voicing of the word of the Lord, spoken six centuries earlier and expressed in the forceful past tense as though then already accomplished. In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. Birth of Jesus made known to the Nephites. As heretofore shown, the prophets of the Western Hemisphere had foretold in great plainness the earthly advent of the Lord, and had specifically set forth the time, place, and circumstances of his birth. 
As the time drew near, the people were divided by conflicting opinions concerning the reliability of these prophecies. And intolerant unbelievers cruelly persecuted those who, like Zacharias, Simeon, Anna, and other righteous ones in Palestine, had maintained in faith and trust their unwavering expectation of the coming of the Lord. Samuel, a righteous Lamanite, who, because of his faithfulness and sacrificing devotion, had been blessed with the spirit and power of prophecy, fearlessly proclaimed the birth of Christ as near. And behold, he said unto them, Behold, I give unto you a sign. For five years more cometh, and behold, then cometh the Son of God to redeem all those who shall believe on his name. The prophet told of many signs and wonders which were to mark the great event. As the five years ran their course, the believers grew more steadfast, the unbelievers more violent, until the last day of the specified period dawned. And this was the day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Nephi, a prophet of the time, cried unto the Lord in anguish of soul because of the persecution of which his people were the victims. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Lift up your head and be of good cheer, for behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given. And on the morrow come I into the world to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. Behold, I come unto my own to fulfill all things which I have made known unto the children of men from the foundation of the world, and do the will both of the Father and of the Son, of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh. And behold, the time is at hand, and this night shall the sign be given. The words of the prophet were fulfilled that night, for though the sun set in its usual course, there was no darkness, and on the morrow the sun rose on a land already illumined, a day and a night and another day had been as one day, and this was but one of the signs. A new star appeared in the firmament of the west, even as was seen by the Magi in the east. And there were many other marvelous manifestations, as the prophets had predicted. All these things occurred on what is now known as the American continent, six hundred years after Lehi and his little company had left Jerusalem to come hither. The Time of the Birth of Jesus The time of the Messiah's birth is a subject upon which specialists in theology and history and those who are designated in literature, the learned, fail to agree. Numerous lines of investigation have been followed only to reach divergent conclusions, both as to the year and as to the month and day within the year at which the Christian era in reality began. The establishment of the birth of Christ as an event marking a time from which chronological data should be calculated was first effected about 532 A.D. by Dionysius Exiguus, and as a basis for the reckoning of time, this method has come to be known as the Dionysian system and takes for its fundamental datum AUC 753, that is to say, 753 years after the founding of Rome, as the year of our Lord's birth. So far as there exists any consensus of opinion among later scholars who have investigated the subject, it is to the effect that the Dionysian calculation is wrong in that it places the birth of Christ between three and four years too late, and that therefore our Lord was born in the third or fourth year before the beginning of what is designated by the scholars of Oxford and Cambridge, the common account called Anno Domini. Without attempting to analyze the mass of calculation data relating to the subject, we accept the Dionysian basis as correct with respect to the year, which is to say that we believe Christ to have been born in the year known to us as B.C. 1, and as shall be shown in an early month of that year. In support of this belief, we cite the inspired record known as the Revelation on Church Government given through Joseph the Prophet in April 1830, which opens with these words. The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh. 
Another evidence of the correctness of our commonly accepted chronology is furnished by the Book of Mormon record. Therein we read that in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the word of the Lord came to Lehi at Jerusalem, directing him to take his family and depart into the wilderness. In the early stages of their journey toward the sea, Lehi prophesied, as had been shown him of the Lord, concerning the impending destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of the Jews. Furthermore, he predicted the eventual return of the people of Judah from their exile in Babylon and the birth of the Messiah, which latter event he definitely declared would take place 600 years from the time he and his people had left Jerusalem. This specification of time was repeated by later prophecy and the signs of the actual fulfillment are recorded as having been realized 600 years from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. These scriptures fix the time of the beginning of Zedekiah's reign as 600 years before the birth of Christ. According to the commonly accepted reckoning, Zedekiah was made king in the year 597 B.C. This shows a discrepancy of about three years between the commonly accepted date of Zedekiah's inauguration as king and that given in the Book of Mormon statement. And as already seen, there is a difference of between three and four years between the Dionysian reckoning and the nearest approach to an agreement among scholars concerning the beginning of the current era. Book of Mormon chronology, therefore, sustains in general the correctness of the common or Dionysian system. As to the season of the year in which Christ was born, there is among the learned as great a diversity of opinion as that relating to the year itself. It is claimed by many biblical scholars that December 25th, the day celebrated in Christendom as Christmas, cannot be the correct date. We believe April 6th to be the birthday of Jesus Christ, as indicated in a revelation of the present dispensation already cited in which that day is made without qualification the completion of the 1830th year since the coming of the Lord in the flesh. This acceptance is admittedly based on faith in modern revelation and in no wise is set forth as the result of chronological research or analysis. We believe that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea April 6, B.C. 1.